Good morning, Perimeter Church. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 6, 1 through 13. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, good. Well, it's good to be with you guys here. I'm here in and out from Sunday to Sunday. If I'm not somewhere else, I'm obviously here, but uh, uh, always, always good to be back and to be uh, sharing God's word with you. Uh, I'm not gonna miss an opportunity. It's almost five years since uh, Jeff took over the reins here and I just won't miss that opportunity to say thank you to him and to, uh, and to just brag that God's using him in a great way. I don't know of a church anywhere that I'm meeting that, that would say that uh, their transition has gone any better than ours. It's been a very fruitful and fun and exciting thing to watch. I'm very thankful to the Lord. And now I get the privilege to uh, share a message that's very, uh, very big in my experience of life and also in my teaching ministry, uh, as Jeff mentioned. I will say that, that I, uh, I pushed back a bit when he asked me to preach on this. I said, these people are getting tired of hearing me speak on this. And they hear it in Journey, they hear it in all these, and he said, no, no, no. And of course, I do as always. I salute to him, anything he says, I say, okay, yes, sir, and there. I can. But I uh, do appreciate, uh, Jeff, all that you're doing, man. Well, uh, you know, the, the title here, Appropriating the Power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the very idea of appropriating, it's not one that we use a lot, perhaps, in our normal conversation, but uh, it, along the, the, the line of, of, of spiritual things and beyond, this is what it actually means. It means to take, grab, or seize. Imagine that, let's just grab, let's, let's, let's hold on to the Holy Spirit and find his power. It's an interesting thing that the last time I preached here, eight weeks ago, that I preached on appropriating uh, the grace needed to build our faith by the use of the table. And now here we're talking about appropriating, this time we're talking about the Holy Spirit so that we may have his power. It's the very same thing, and you're gonna see a unique teaching. If you were here before, and you're here now, you're gonna see a unique, interesting in, uh, insight that I'll give at the very end, uh, which I usually wouldn't give in this message because I don't have the two sitting side by side like we've done in these last two messages I've given. But I'll point that out when we, when we do uh, get there. Uh, the reason I love sharing this, not only because it's such an important part of scripture, but I very much enjoy it because it's a game changer. It really is in a lot of lives. This last week, someone from out of town had moved away from here as a member many years, several years back, and uh, just uh, you know, asked the, the question, got in touch with me and said, uh, uh, let me ask, when is the, uh, where's the place I can go? There was a message you gave years ago when we were at Perimeter Church, uh, and it has three key words to it, and no, consider, present. Uh, 
can you tell me when you've preached that, where that is, and how we can get a hold of it? And then, lo and behold, here it is. I'm, I'm preaching it this weekend. But uh, these were the words that he, that he said in his communication. He said, it sure made a difference in my life. It sure made a difference. So I'm going to suggest to all of us here, whether you're a seeker trying to figure out, you know, what is the, what is the way to God? How do you find Christ? Or is Christ the way? Uh, whether you're a believer of many, many years, I know this, that many of us view Christianity as basically a religion where people turn up the willpower and try to obey God. If that's your story, I am trying so hard and I'm hopefully getting more obedient, but oh, I don't know. This message would be for you. And this is a message for me. Every time I preach it, I say, thank you, Lord, I got to preach it because I'm preaching it to myself. All right, so here's what we'll do. I've got two very simple, simple, simple uh, truths that I'm going to uh, lay out and then close with one last, which is a very, very profound truth. And uh, we'll jump into the depth of that in the third point. But the first uh, is simply this. There are two kinds of people in the world. Now, I think most all of you would understand what that means. Some of you may not. But just to make it as simple and simple, in the Bible, everybody is divided into two groups. One is called the natural man or a natural person. The other is called spiritual. So everybody's either natural or spiritual. It's going to be one or the other. Those are non-believers versus believers, natural and spiritual. So I'm going to raise a few questions here. I won't ask you to respond as I do in smaller churches and venues when I give this, but I'll let you just have just a second to think, do you have the answer? And then find out, did you have the correct answer? So here it is. Number one question. All natural people are in the likeness of someone. Who is that person that they're in the likeness of? And don't say it. But think just a minute, and if you said, Adam, you're correct. Every natural person is in the likeness of Adam. And thus, we call it, we are in Adam. The very words in Scripture, we are in Adam, meaning in the likeness of Adam. All right? Number two question would be this. Spir or, uh, spiritual people are in the likeness of someone. Who is that? Well, I bet most of you got that one. And that is we're in the likeness of Jesus. Literally in, in Jesus. The Bible refers to that. We're in Jesus or we're not in Jesus. Jesus is in us or he's not in us. Either way you look at it. But it's literally Jesus in his likeness. Number three question. The natural person has how many natures? So you think about that. Okay, the non-believer, how many natures does that person have? And that is one nature. It's the old sin nature of man. And the next and final question, the spiritual person has how many natures? And the answer there is two. We have an old nature, the sin nature, and we have a new nature. So to wrap up the first point, two kinds of people, natural, who are in Adam, have one nature, and then the spiritual person who are in Jesus, and we have we have two natures. Don't you wish every point that a pastor made of his three or however many would be that quick? That's pretty good, isn't it? Let's go to number two. Don't be deceived. Number three is coming. <laughs> there are two certainties true of every spiritual person. So let's take the Christian now. What's true of them? Here's the first. They are sealed. That's S-E-A-L-E-D. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed with the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit has come into them and is sealed never to leave again. We will always be in the likeness of Jesus when the Holy Spirit has indwelt us. Here's what it says in Ephesians 1.13. There it says this, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Very simply put, once you believe, 
There it is. We are sealed with him. Number two, though, we are capable. Doesn't mean we are, but we are now, as spiritual people, we're capable of being filled, F-I-L-L-E-D, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Ephesians 5.18 says this, puts it this way. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 puts it this way. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Well, to walk by the Spirit is to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, but what is this desire of the flesh? That's the sin that arises in each of our lives all through the day. Every moment we're awake, it's, I mean, it's, there's sin coming out of that sin nature. That's what we want to control. But as it does, we have to realize that it creates the desires of the flesh, that old nature. And those sins that are coming out are called the desires of the flesh. Selfishness, jealousy, unjust anger, worry, lust, and the list just goes on and on and on. So if we were to skip down to Galatians 5, I won't read the text, but it says, when walking in the Spirit, that we have this thing called the fruit of the Spirit. And he lists the fruit in its description. And the fruit of the Spirit, if we're walking in the Spirit, not in the desires of the flesh, then we're gonna have fruit such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so forth. And he lists there the fruit of the Spirit. That's what should be coming out of our existence day in and day out as Christians. Well, it's not the story of most of us, to the degree certainly that we would think it should be. And it's always gonna be a continual batter, battle, but the Christian life is learning how do you see that fruit more and more and more, the desires of the flesh less and less and less. That's what we're looking to figure out. So here's the question I'd ask you. What do you do when you wake up in the middle of the night, you lay awake, can't get back to sleep, and the reason, perhaps, there are a lot of reasons why we can't go back to sleep at night. Right, older people? So it, it happens. But what if it's because you've been hurt? You've been wronged. I mean, somebody has done something despicable to you. And they've gotten away with it. And they continue at you. They become those that you, you hate and you lay there battling hate. But then you come to church and you hear, Christian, love your enemy. This is the will of God. What happens when you're laying there? Very unhappily in existence because of what's going on in your life. Unhappy, defeated, discouraged, you go, oh my goodness. You battle and you battle. And then you come to church and you hear the message, be joyful, rejoice in all things. And you compare those texts to your existence laying down and you go, that's not where I am. What about if you're worried, you're anxious, in depression? Now there are a lot of different depressions, some are chemical. But the reality is, a lot of our depressions and anxiety and issues are because of circumstances. It's called circumstantial depression. And then we read in the Word of God, or we hear one of the sermons, and it says, let the peace of God guard your hearts in all things. And what we do is we're honest and we say, impossible. Can't do it. I've tried. Doesn't work. No hope. And then just to lay on a little bit heavier guilt upon us, we read 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says so clearly, no temptation has taken you but such is common to man. God is faithful, not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you're you're able, but will, with the temptation, provide a way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. And we lay there and we say, there is no escape. 
I've looked at every wall and there is no door out of where I am right now. I'm locked in here, I can't get out, and more than that, I'm gonna have to say, God, where are you? Because I wanna get out of the very thing that you command me to get out of, I wanna get to the very thing you've told me I have to get to, and it's just not working. And I have certainly tried. My belief is that most of us as Christians, most of us, not you, us, most of us spend most of our time living out of willpower. There's nothing wrong with willpower. But when we as Christians make that the way that we're gonna kill the desires of the flesh, we come empty-handed. I might ask the question, when's the last time that you have found yourself consciously appropriating what's called the power of the Holy Spirit? So that you might have the fruit of the Spirit. How many consciously pray that appropriation? Well, it's language that some of us are not even familiar with, and that's okay, because it's just we're not, we don't hear it enough probably, but you may be new to this whole understanding. And that is, oh, we can appropriate other power? What kind of power? Oh, the power of God. How of God? God's spirit. What, how would that happen? Well, that's what we want to be able to understand. One other thing, and we'll move to the last, last point. This came as an illustration to me through one of our great staff here uh, who happens to uh, be a security uh, staff and uh, years ago, you'll see how dated this really is, a number of years ago, he came riding up to the church. Early morning, I got here early, and here he comes coming in for his job, as I did for mine. And I see him, and I stop, and I start talking to him. And I say, wow, you, you came on a bicycle. I came in a car. Where do you live? And he told me. And it was much further than where I live. And I said, you rode your bike here? He said, every day, rain or shine. I said, you really ride your bike here? Yeah. Well, when he told me where he lived, I realized there are, there are hills and you know, valleys. I go, oh my goodness, I'm impressed. He said, don't be. Look at my bike. I'd never seen an electric bike before. <laughs> never heard of one. He says, you see that big thing down there? Yeah, that's a motor. You see the little button on the handlebar? Yeah, that's the button, that, that's the start. You just, I get, I see a hill coming, doop, I hit it and it just takes me right up to the top. And then I just carry my way on down. I pedal when I need to pedal. I heard that and I went, my, my, my. That's the story of my life. That's the story of all of our lives, isn't it? that we're on a bike of life and, and we wake up in the morning and as Christians we say, God, I love you, I wanna serve you, I want to obey you, so I, I'm gonna obey as I meet the temptation, the hills of temptations that I'm gonna face and I'm gonna battle right through it and I'll get to the top and we mean it with all of our hearts and so we get on our bikes and here comes the first big hill of temptation and we get going and we don't make it halfway, we're off and we feel so guilty, so bad, oh God, forgive me, I, I didn't really try, I should have, I gave in, I shouldn't have, I'm sorry, but tomorrow when I hit this hill, different story, promise you. Next morning, oh God, I'm about to meet that hill, I wanna be prepared today, and so Lord, I'm gonna commit it, I will do it, I will do it, I will do it, and then whoom, you try even harder, and you don't get two thirds of the way up the hill, you get off, that thing happens about three or four times until finally, we step off of the bike, and we say, I can't, I just can't. And it comes in ways like, I can't love my wife. You'd have to know her to understand. You can't love my husband, you'd have to know him to understand. I can't this, I can't that, I can't love the enemy, I can't do this, I can't do that. And then we give up. We don't even feel that we should be following Christ because we're not living for him. Well, there is a third very important truth. This is the one that's profound. 
And I'd put it this way. Number three. There are three important words in Romans 6, 1 through 13 that we just read that give understanding to being filled with the Holy Spirit. This means appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit. So here are the three words, and I'll just break them down and let you see them in Scripture, and then I'm going to close with an illustration, a couple little illustrations. The first is the word know, K-N-O-W. K-N-O-W. You see it three different times when we read our text. I'll jump to them just to review them here real quickly. Number one is found in verse three of chapter six of Romans. It says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And then we won't show it, but in verse five, it talks about us being united in Jesus. So we're back in Jesus now. So, okay, we're in Jesus. What else? He says in, in verse six, he follows it saying, knowing this. That's the second time he says, no, now know again, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. If you go to verse nine, you'll see, you'll see the, the next and third time where it says, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead is never to die again, death is no longer master over him. Well, you just saw the words, but you don't know what that means by just looking at it and hearing it that quick. I know that. So I'm gonna simplify it as, easy, as best as I can. Here's what these verses are saying. It's saying, here's what you need to know. Know is something that we put up here. We've gotta know. Well, what? Well, we've gotta know that we have died to sin. That's the first thing. The word death means separated. We have died to sin. The second thing is we've been united with Jesus. And the third thing, we gotta know that we've been raised up to a newness of life. If you try to find power in your life without that knowledge and understanding, you're gonna be helpless. You're back to the world and its ways. It just doesn't work. Died, buried, and raised with Jesus. Let's look at verse six, just a little closer again. In verse six, it says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, what does old self mean? If I have a congregation that's smaller and I'm interacting with them, I'll say, what do you think it means? And I know what I'm gonna hear, I hear it every single time. We say, old nature. And people feel very confident to say that. That's what it says. We don't know that all of us that know this, that our old self, there's the old self, there's the old nature. It's not. That is not the old nature. Hmm, that's important to know. Well, what's the old self? The old self is Randy before he became a Christian. Gone, you'll never see it again. That's, that's who he's referring to. It's Jeff as a non-Christian. None of us will ever know Jeff as a non-Christian. He's a follower. And so what he's saying here is that, okay, the old self was crucified with Christ. Then it says this, that our body of sin might be done away with. Now we're talking about the old nature. And here's what's so confusing is we as laymen read the text. We say, okay, the old body of sin, the old nature might be done away with. Well, I guess when you become a Christian, the old nature's gone, right? No. But it says has been done away with. It's a horrible translation. If you look in the footnote of most Bibles, you will see it say, and the little, in the footnote it'll say, actually rendered powerless. That's what it means. The non-Christian is gone. But now the, the life that lives within me, this new nature, let me tell you, the good news, it has been rendered powerless. I use this as an illustration. Many of you remember this one. A story of, of, of the three, or the picture of three fists. I only have two, I'll use, the, use them, I'll, I'll add another one in just a minute, you'll see how. Here's my first fist, and it, it refers to me. This is who I am or who you are. This is the nature of sin over here. And what happens is, is that at Conception, boom, 
locked forever unless something powerfully changes it. So what needs to happen? We need to die to sin, knowing that you have died to sin. Death means separation. Boom! I just became a Christian. Here's me. Here's my, here's my old nature. It's very much within me, but they're separated now. It's been rendered powerless. Well, how's that going to work? Well, I've got to have a new power. And so I'll take a third fist over here, assume this is still there, and I come across, and now the Holy Spirit indwells me, indwells you. Here we are. Mm, never to get a, oh, good. You don't have to ever worry about losing a real, true salvation. We've been sealed with him, with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so that's what we need to keep in mind, knowing that I have died to sin. I've been united to Jesus. I've been raised up to newness of life. But then the second illustration is of a, a pirate's ship. To understand this idea of rendered powerless. It's like a, a captain, old Captain Jones. Oh man, he's a wicked old captain. Everybody hates him. And the ship is out coming into port soon, but they say, you know what, we gotta, we gotta get rid of this old, old captain. Nobody likes him, nobody's supportive. So we can, we, can, we can have mutiny here. They plan it one late evening and they charge into his room barracks, they pull him out, they cuff him and they say, to the plank. Somebody says, whoa, 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 who's gonna be our captain? He turns around and says, well, how about, how about Smith over here? Smith is the, he's the kindest, strongest, good leader, but loving, kind, good. Let's, let's have him. And says, okay, I'll be your new captain. And so immediately they say, let's, let's have him walk the plank. And the new captain said, if I'm the new captain, I want to tell you, don't do that. What? No, don't, don't have him walk the plank. We don't need to do that. We're going to port in just a day or so. And when we get to port, we'll put him out. We'll head out. We won't ever see him again. They like, okay, if that's what you want to do. So now the new captain, Smith, says, all right, gentlemen, let's tell you what we're going to do. Now you've got a full day of nothing but pleasure. Don't. No work, no chores, nothing. Enjoy your day or two till we get to port. And so they're all laying around playing cards and sleeping, taking naps all over the deck. A beautiful day. And then here comes the old Captain, uh, Captain uh, uh, Jones comes around. Sees a few of them laying down, playing cards or whatever. And he says, get up and swab the deck. And they jump up immediately. They grab their pails. They grab their mops. And they're just working in the heat. And they're sweating. And an hour or two later, here comes Captain Smith. And he turns the corner. He says, gentlemen, what are you doing? Why are you doing? You don't need to do this. Don't you understand that, that I said rest? You are no longer required to do that. Oh, but, but, but Captain Jones told us we had to do it. And Smith says, do you not know that he has been rendered powerless? He has no power. Oh, oh, that's right. And that's the state of Christians today. Oh, that's right. I, I didn't even, that's why, that's why Paul says, you got to know that these things have happened. Oh, well, we know it, but in some respects, we, it's like we don't know it. And that takes us to the second word, which is consider. That's found in verse 11. This is what it says there. It says, even so, Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ, uh, it, to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 11. There it is. So that means to take into account. The word means to take into account. Take into account of what? Well, that I have died to sin, been united to Jesus, been raised up. Oh, that's what it is. It'd be like, I mean, I was, I've been an a, a avid tennis player for many, many years until recent years, and I, and I, I tell you, I love tennis, and I got to where I'd like to play this, and I could play the game okay, and, and I might be playing somebody who's at a different level, lower than my level, and, and I know I should beat them, and it, they beat me, and I know it's why, because they went to my backhand, and my backhand was just off. I couldn't figure out the backhand. And I'm in the shower and I'm so confused. What happened? What happened? I don't usually do that. What, what happened? What happened? And all of a sudden in the shower, I go, oh my goodness, look where my racket head was. Oh, I, I couldn't get a, a, on top of the ball there. I, what was I thinking? So in the shower, did I learn something about tennis? No. I considered something now that I've known for years and years. That's what we do. We have brain leakage. That's what I call it. 
and we know stuff and it's gone like we didn't even know it. No, it's there. We just have to consider what we know. So these first two words, kind of in summary, know and consider, describe an informed mind. Hear that? Mind. Because the third word is going to describe a surrendered heart. Mind and heart. The word present. Look at it in verse 13. Verse 13 reads like this. We'll grab it up. Oh. 13 says this, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of righteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Well, well what do you mean? You're, you're talking about this idea of present your members. What are your members, your body? Well, how about the eyes, what we see, our ears, what we hear, our mouth, what we say, our hearts, what we, what we find our affection in? What about our hands, what we do, our feet, where we go? It's, it's every part of our being. He says, here's what you need to do. You need to, as you consider what you know, you need to present, surrender. You've gotta be informed, but there takes a surrender, and that takes us to faith. Oh, we have to do this by faith. That's why what we learned about the table we're about to take is so dramatically important that we have to appropriate the faith by grace, by God's goodness to us. I like to uh, use an illustration that kind of closes out this idea of present. Uh, there was a man that very, very godly, and I mean really godly man, 10 years my senior maybe, when I was growing up as a young, young believer in high school age, I, I just remember, I, I, I looked at him, I said, oh, if I could ever be like him in the faith. So I went to him one day and I said, hey, is there some kind of secret you've got to how you live so obediently to God? I, I wanna know the secret if there is. He said, hmm, yeah. I can explain it to you easily. I said, how's that? He said, do you do push-ups? I said, I do do push-ups. Well, what would be the max that you could do at one setting, pure push-ups, how many could you do? I gave him the number. I was doing push-ups. I said, I, I could do that. I, I just, that's, that's it. I know. That would be an extreme. That would be the very, very, very max. He said, okay. I want you to get down, and I want you to do that number. And I do. The last one, you can imagine how hard, if it's truly the last one, can't even make it up. But you do, if you hit your number. And then he looks to me, and he says, if you can now start right now, and you can do one more, then I'll give you a million dollars. What? Let's assume he's a millionaire. He's not, but he just made the story. And I said, I'll give you a million dollars. One more, and I go, look, I'm on the floor, and I go, okay, you think I can do it? Well, I, I bet I could, just adrenaline would probably. So I said, I'll give it a try, and so sure enough, I go down, and I'm, ugh, ugh just trying and shaking and shaking and shaking and I think, can I? I don't know if I can. Maybe I can. I, I do it. And then he says, five million if you can do one more. He said, would you try? I said, well, sure, i try. And he said, you know what would happen? About the time you broke your arms, boom, you'd hit the floor. You'd probably look up to me and say, I can't. He said, Randy, when you get there in your walk with Jesus, that you know you can't, and only he can, that's when God's power begins to take place. But it's not just a remembering what God has done. It's a surrender. And so I'm gonna put on the, on the board here something I've not given to others before, but I thought this would help. Just two little statements. To remember is to acknowledge in your mind that only God's Spirit can empower you to obey and not sin, okay? I'm gonna say it again. To remember is to acknowledge in your mind that only God's Spirit can empower you to obey and then not sin. Now let's look at surrender. To surrender is to choose to willfully obey knowing, God, knowing your willpower will have to be boosted by God's power. Did you see the two words, mind 
And, and then the, the whole idea of will, the mind and the will. That's where I think some of us really get off track a little bit. We don't really believe it's just the mind and the will. Uh, we think that, well, maybe there's a third, and that's the emotions. That's the real deal. See, emotions are good in and of themselves. I don't want you to hear me wrong. But I tell you what, emotions are taking us crazy in this world today. This generation is just totally over. I mean, they're just, they're, we've lost the whole you know, decency of thought to understand emotions correctly. Everything's emotion. Everything's emotion. But there's nothing wrong with emotion. It's its abuse. It is dangerously misleading. So here's my story. Back to two little, two stories. The story of, first of all, a little girl. Let's say the girl's three years old. She's with her family. They go to the mountain. They check into their little you know, cabin, high on the mountain. Parents are in their downstairs bedroom getting everything unpacked. And, and she's upstairs with her little suitcase with her teddy bear in the suitcase. She's unpacking hers. And she's standing there, and she opens the suitcase. And she takes her little teddy bear, and she hugs her bear. And about that time, she looks in the frame of the door, and there is a six-foot grizzly bear that's made it some way into the house, up the steps, and now is about to come toward her. And he, she sees that grizzly bear, and she looks at her little bear, and she says, oh boy, big, live teddy bear. So what does she do? She runs toward the teddy bear. And I'll let you fill in what happens next. Right? Here's the second story parallel to it. Everything's the same except the little girl is now 16. And she is now unpacking her bag. And she sees in the door frame a six foot grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear as she sees that grizzly bear coming toward her, she says, oh no, grizzly bear will kill me. She's on the second floor. She looks at a floor-length window behind her. She says, I'm gonna have to raise that window and jump, and I'm gonna at least break my ankles, maybe my legs, who knows what I'm, but I know this, I've gotta do that. She raises the window, she jumps to her broken legs. But she doesn't get mauled by that, by that bear. Maybe caused her some pain, but nothing like would have happened. Having told you that, I want you to hear this. Please know this. Your mind, what you believe, impacts how you feel. And most of us are now surrendered to following our feelings. And it's taken us to some deadly grizzly bears. And what we have to do is learn to discern what's a grizzly bear and what's a teddy bear. As I keep trying to tell my grandkids in different ways and diff others too, I say, you know, there's some teddy bears out there and there's some grizzly bears. And you better learn which one's teddy and which one is grizzly because you run to the wrong bear, it's gonna swallow you up. And you cannot let your emotions determine what you're going to do. See, it's our mind affects our emotions that affect our behavior, whether you jump out the window or you run toward the, the uh, grizzly bear. So this is my other, I wanted to journal. This morning, I journaled some thoughts that I'm just gonna read to you. After hearing that, I would say this. Minds inform us what is true. Our will determines what we do. We must never trust our emotions. Nothing wrong with emotions but don't distrust them at face value. The word trust is used to define faith, huh? Their mind, surrender, emotions. That's what needs to, it needs to, it needs to be faith, not feeling. The Christian must often obey by faith. They must obey by faith, even when our emotions scream at us to obey our feelings. That's when we must determine whether we are moving toward the teddy bear or the grizzly bear. But what do we do 
When we're awake at night, do we think on the truth or do we listen to our emotions? Do we appropriate God's power to obey or do we rely on our willpower to do so? So what will, what will we do at night when we fail to feel the presence of God. Hear this, because a lot of us are battling this. I don't feel the presence of God. I'm praying and I don't see, God's not here. Will we assume God is not present when we wait till we feel him near and he doesn't? Or do we live by faith, knowing that feelings are often not reliable? Now what I'm doing is teaching you a very simple theology. And it's teaching what the Bible teaches, and it's called progressive sanctification. It is not instantaneous. Well, I prayed it, and I was there, and I didn't lose it. I didn't. No, no, no. It's going to chip away, 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 until finally victory. But oh, we think, I got to feel it. No, no, no. So just keep in mind, we need to appropriate the power of the Holy Spirit. So I conclude with this, a little prayer that I pray. I pray it over and over, through the day, begin the day, and it goes like this. It simply says, resolved to consider what I know. I just flip them around. Resolved to consider what I know and to present to you, Lord, the members of my body as instruments of righteousness. So Lord, my eyes, what I'm gonna look at today, my ears, what I'm gonna listen to, my mouth, what I'm gonna say, my heart, where my affections are gonna go, my hands, what I do, my feet, where I go. I can do that or not do that, but just say, Lord, I know what it means, it's just this, my whole being. It's yours and when I see me take my mouth back, boom, say something, go, oh God, let me, let me give you my mouth back. I just took it away. Empower me with your spirit now because I'm gonna do that again without your power to enable me to obey. This is what's gonna take us now to the table. And when we get to the table, we're gonna now be able to do the very thing that we've talked about. But I want you to remember as we take the table. Do you remember eight weeks ago I said, don't rely on your feelings how well this table takes you to faith. Grace can be imparted without feelings. You may have them. I'll tell you what we have to do. We have to stare at the cross. But we have to remember that obedience is what God wants. And so it's the will. And the will is perfectly good to live by the will with the power of God's assistant. You can skip the emotion and still survive. If the emotions are there and are with the grizzly, or with the teddy bear, perfectly fine. But I'll tell you this, when we live by faith and we start trying to do this on a daily basis, it's going to seem impossible at times. And you say, well, I will find the power of God. God gives you the power. You say, I feel like I just willed it. No emotion. I think that's what honors God the most. He says, that's what faith is. Obedience because of what I say. And so keep going. You're okay. I'm going to ask us now, if we would, to pray and we're going to prepare for the table, all right? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I ask you now that you would enable us to be prepared in the right way as we come before this table and to keep in mind that we're appropriating grace and we want to see our faith enlarged because of it. And so, Father, would you grant that even now as we come before you and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information, to give us your feedback, and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.